Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, for those of you that haven't gotten a chance to meet yet, uh, my name is Rosalie Welber, and I'm the Membership Coordinator for Revolutionary Spaces. I'm proud to be part of a Revolutionary Spaces team that has transformed our programming and fundraising efforts into the virtual world, uh, adapting so we can still carry out our mission through this challenging time. Uh, although we are mostly digital these days, our organization is still striving to produce dynamic programming, community partnerships that bring people together to explore the history and continuing work of democracy that is so singularly evoked by the two national treasures we care for and interpret, the Old State House and the Old South Meeting House. Our member event today is centered on the Revolutionary Era and the protests that occurred in and around these buildings in the 18th century. Sharing their knowledge and insight with us today are President and CEO of Revolutionary Spaces, Nat Chidley, and Director of Public and Community Programs, Erica Lindemood. In striving to make this conversation relevant to our world today, we'll not only be discussing historic events, uh, but the ways that these moments of our nation's history can inform our current dialogue. Um, it's not often that bare facts or events of history um, alone help to grow our understanding of the past, but the ways in which we discuss them and the different lenses and questions that we apply to them will really further our understanding of the past to continue these thoughts today. On that note, uh, we welcome your questions. Uh, for those of you who have included a question in your registration for the event, thank you. Uh, many of those will be touched upon in our discussions and as questions come up during the program, we'd love to hear them. Um, please remember to use the chat button on the bottom bar and we'll be able to go through those questions closer to the end of the program so you'll have time to write one in. To start us off on our discussion, I wanted to bring us back to a piece that Nat wrote last week. Um, for those of you who haven't seen the Revolutionary Spaces blog on Washington Street, uh, Nat reflects on the revolutionary protests that marched through our city. Uh, you wrote that Boston streets are hallowed ground for our American tradition of protest. And I was wondering if you could start off our chat today by kind of going into that a little bit and really what you meant there. Sorry, I have a recurring problem with muting on these um, Zoom meetings. <laughs> Anyhow, thank you, Rosalie. Um, I appreciate the question and the opportunity to um, to sort of share some of the thoughts that I posted in that blog entry. But before I do that, I just wanted to add my word of welcome to everybody. Um, I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to connect with our members and with prospective members. Um, I'm just so looking forward to the moment when we can meet in person and have a uh, a, uh, a warm dialogue. Um, somehow these uh, virtual programs, which are an opportunity to share ideas, don't quite do what meeting in person does. Um, the post that I, I wrote last week really was, um, it stemmed from a couple of photographs that we saw of the of Washington Street in front of the old state house and old south meeting house choked with protesters. There was a, um, there was a, an event that happened on City Hall Plaza late last week in the late afternoon, and the route of um, the route that the marchers took to get there went down Washington Street, and so um, those spaces uh, just outside um, our two sites were really filled with throngs of folks holding protest signs and um, and making their voices heard, and it. You know, it just really struck me that well, we know here in Boston that when we protest, we're walking quite literally in the footsteps of the revolutionary generation. We don't always know it in the sense of reflecting on it and thinking about it, what it means. Um, and what I wanted to suggest was not that the past in this instance um, is a, a particularly useful point of comparison, but what it is is a reminder for us um, that the work that we're engaged in as citizens today is part of a long arc of work that Americans have, um, have engaged in for generations. And we're still grappling with fundamental questions about who gets to have a voice, um, about what the appropriate recourse is for those who feel themselves to have been excluded from the political process, uh, about what our responsibilities are as citizens when we feel like our lives and our communities and our liberties are threatened. And also um, the question of whether there are 
uh, boundaries we shouldn't cross when we're um, taking to the streets to make our voices heard. And those questions have been very um, alive for us in the, in the past few weeks, quite appropriately. Um, and I think it's helpful for us to remember that they were alive also for the revolutionary generation, the same questions. And so we're entering into a conversation that has been going on for a very long time. And from that perspective, um, when protesters take to the streets and force us to grapple with these questions, they are acting in the most deeply patriotic sense, right? Protest in the sense is fundamentally patriotic. Um, and we should remember that even as we grapple with, um, with what it means for us today. Thank you, Nat. Um, and uh, Erica, I'll turn to you for this next question. Um, for revolutionary spaces, we look to the past of Old South Meeting House and the Old State House to guide our conversations today. Um, and as we look back to late 18th century, which protests are most emblematic of this era in these two buildings? And as our uh, Old South Meeting House expert, I don't know if you could get us started there. Now you're on mute. <laughs> You'd think after all this time we'd have it down, but we don't. <laughs> it's an active dialogue. Oh my goodness. All right. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so, uh, yeah. So I've been thinking over the last few days here, we've, uh, we've been kind of thinking about this, um, this program and conversation and, um, <sighs> And yeah, I just, um, I, the more I think about it, the more, um, the more, in some ways, the more complex it, it, it gets in, in my brain because I keep, you know, we're, we're talking about, I was just writing down a list of all of these words and maybe I'll just share it because I think um, we're talking about, we're talking about a bunch of different things. We're, I think we're talking about protest as kind of a central thing. And we use the word rebellion in the title for this event. So I kind of put those two words together. Um, and then debate is another term that is also um, often used somewhat, um, uh, well, in, in combination with these other terms, memorial, justice and action and demands and so I have all these things kind of mixing in my head right now um, and um, so I think uh, though we if we look at the Old South Meeting House at that era um, there there are several kind of um, key moments of you know large gatherings that happen in in inside Old South Meeting House having been the the largest indoor gathering space at that during that time. Um, so when the crowds were large, that's where they that's where they ended up meeting inside. Um, and um, there was the gathering that happened there um, following the uh, the seizure of um, Han uh, John Hancock's uh, sloop, the uh, Liberty, um, in the summer of 1768. Uh, there were the, and then they, they kind of, if we're doing a timeline, then there's kind of this overlap because um, then we had the, the gatherings that, that happened after the Boston massacre in 1770. So we had the, the gathering that happened as a kind of um, immediate, almost kind of memorial service of sorts, but a, a protest also um, that happened the day following um, on, on the 6th of March, 1770. And then we had in subsequent years, um, that annual uh, kind of memorial gathering that included a, um, an oration. And, and so there were those, those and, the, and, and those are, I think, starting, we've been giving those, those moments a lot of attention in the last several years. So they're starting to get more um, kind of well-known, at least locally, but, um, in the broader community. Uh, but then, of course, most famously, we have those meetings uh, that preceded the destruction of the tea in 1773. Um, and um, they, they 
often kind of get nicknamed things like the Boston Tea Party meetings and um, uh, one of the, um, the things that I like to point out is that they, they were, that those, those meetings were not, they were not planning meetings <laughs> to, uh, about, you know, to, to plan out how to, how to destroy the tea, um, dump the tea into the harbor. They were, um, they were gatherings to discuss really the sort of, to discuss the concepts uh, and also uh, largely the pragmatics of what are we going to do now? So we, we've come together. Um, we've got a majority of people in this crowd of thousands that is um, committed to not allowing this tea to come to land and to be taxed. Um, and so, but what are we going to do about that? Um, and um, so, uh, there's some degree of debate, and then there's a lot of uh, kind of fiery discussion, um, but th they also were, um, it, it was, these also were tamed versions of, you know, it, 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 th this was not a mob, you know, this was, uh, this, these were structured, um, meetings that involved that included a voting process um, and decision making process about what what are we going to do next um, it wasn't what are we going to do next literally about that it didn't get to the point of what are we going to do next in terms of there in terms of the uh, destruction of the tea but what are we going to do next to see if we can resolve this problem in in an orderly way <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Erica, one of the things that, that just comes to mind while listening to you talk is, um, you know, that when you mention uh, these, these weren't, this wasn't a mob, um, there was an effort to, to have a sort of orderly process and conversation, is just the degree to which organizers of protest um, during those years leading up to the beginning of the Revolutionary War were preoccupied with the question of the, legitim of the legitimacy of what they were engaged in. So they're, they're constantly engaged in an effort um, to, uh, to show that there is some kind of due process even within the protest movement itself. Um, you know, I, I love the fact that frequently protests involve some kind of appropriation of the mechanics of, of governance. So, um, you know, even in that protest that you referred to um, that followed the seizure of Hancock's sloop, um, right, that, so Hancock was suspected of smuggling um, and, uh, and the ship is seized in order to be inspected. And the, the crowd appears on the waterfront to try to liberate whatever cargo might be inside the ship. And they're frustrated because the, the ship is lashed to a British naval vessel and they can't get at it. So they decide instead um, to uh, vent their anger on the customs officials who had impounded the ship by going up the waterfront to a wharf where one of the customs officers had a pleasure vessel. It's described in the records as a pleasure vessel. They they drag it out of the water. You've got a, over a thousand people now. They haul the boat more than a mile across surface streets in Boston to the Liberty Tree, and then they conduct a trial. And they actually try the ship for crimes against the country, find it guilty and sentence it to die. And then they take it to the common and they tear it apart and they burn it. Um, and I mean, I just love that story because I think that the uh, creativity of the crowd is really remarkable. But what's interesting in this context is that they, they are, they're concerned about how the protest might be perceived. And so they're reaching for the trappings of legitimacy. And I think part of the, you know, to come back to like, how does protest um, intersect with the two sites that we care for. Um, you know, there there are so the the old state house figures differently, or the townhouse as it was called at the time, because it was the seat of government. And so, to the extent that protesters wanted to vent their anger, it was often the target. Um, and frequently, um, the concern about legitimacy is bound up with the moments where protests may go too far. 
Um, so when I was writing that um, that essay last week, I was thinking very much of the August 1765 protest that is really often seen by historians as the first protest on the road to revolution. Um, and it's in, in opposition to the Stamp Act, um, which still hadn't gone into effect, but they know it's coming um, and they're trying to figure out how to defeat the thing. And there's just this this crazy protest that begins down the street, um, what we now call Washington Street, where it intersects with Essex, where there was big elm overhanging the street and um, the crowd hangs effigies of some of the public figures that are seen as responsible for the Stamp Act. Um, and, you know, the effigies actually include visual puns. It's quite funny and it gathers a huge crowd. But then at the end of the, at the, end of the day of protest, they cut the effigies down um, and they carry them through town. They go down what's today Washington Street, so they pass Old South Meeting House, they reach the townhouse, the old state house, and they turn right and they go through the ground floor of the building, chanting no stamps. And they're carrying this effigy and the power and the anger of that crowd of people, right? In a town of 15,000, you've got, you know, 2,000, 3,000 protesters in this crowd. It's terrifying for the men upstairs who are the government officers. But that's, that's only going so far. But what they do next is they go to a warehouse belonging to Andrew Oliver, who, was, who had accepted the office of being the stamp distributor. He was the one person through whom enforcement of the Stamp Act passed. They tear down the warehouse, and then they take the, 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 the sort of timbers from the warehouse, they bring it up the street to within view of Oliver's house. They build a bonfire because all protests in Revolutionary Boston included a bonfire. Um, and as night fell, they try the effigy of Oliver and they find it guilty. And while he's looking out the window, they tear its head off and they throw it in the fire, right? And it's not surprising the next morning, Oliver resigns because he's terrified for his life, right? Um, and they can't find anybody to take his place because nobody wants to be the target of the crowd. So incredibly effective protest, but in the minds of some, it crossed the line. Right? So there's a, there's a destruction of property. There's threats against people's lives. Um, and uh, I think the organizers of subsequent protests are concerned to distance themselves from that. Whoa, like, how do we not go there? And how do we communicate that we're even in the midst of protests where we're claiming the voice we have been denied, we're doing so in a thoughtful, rational, reasoned, process-driven way. Sorry for that long direction. <laughs> I'm actually going to um, ask a question about something you had mentioned, Erica. Um, you talked about the idea of memorial as one of your words. Um, and you mentioned the 5th of March orations. And those most certainly were a form of protest. That was part of what they meant to do. But they're not often kind of put in the same bucket as a lot of the other revolutionary protests. Um, is there, do you think, a difference in how we can interpret that today, how we approach it differently? Um, they are kind of in their own little separate bucket, I think. I mean, I think I think they are in in uh, somewhat unique in in that they. I mean, there were memorials, and um, as um, as Nat has has often pointed out, and when we've done public programs focused on on these events and the speeches, that they're they're memorials and also calls to action. Um, they're um, uh, and, and, and I, I think um, it, it's interesting, you know, I've, I've been looking and reminding myself of kind of the, the um, arc through from this 18th century um, into the 20th century of of different instances of um, uh, memorials uh, at Old South Meeting House, and then um, to some extent in other in other places that kind of uh, relate to those memorials, um, and if you look at the uh, what was happening with 
if you look at the, the speeches that were given in the 1770s at Old South Meeting House, and then uh, where they were basically, you know, at the, at the end of the, the to Dr. Joseph Warren's 1775 um, oration, uh, he's, you know, he's not, he's not, it's not a call to arms, but he is, he's saying, you know, that the future generations are going to depend upon what, what you do now, um, where basically our, you know, uh, our, our rights are, um, are endangered. And um, so it, it, it's, it is a call to action. Um, and so the, so the memorial is then, um, it, it's, it serves a function of taking place in a moment where you feel like there's some kind of injustice um, that's pervading and you use the memorial as a kind of a um, jumping off point to say, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna mourn and recognize the life of these, this person or these people, the lives of these people, um, these individuals uh, that are lost and, um, and we're gonna use this as a, you know, to say sometimes they didn't die in vain. Um, and so we're gonna make sure that, that things change in one way or another. So, um, so that, that happened at that time. And then in the 1850s, um, so at the beginning, so in 1858, I believe, um, 1858, I think it was, yeah, 1858, March 5th, 1858, I'm pretty sure. Um, was uh, the Christmas Addicts Memorial that took place at Faneuil Hall. And um, in the introduction to that, um, to that event, um, one of the orators um, made, um, it, it sort of told the history of how the Boston, the, the Boston massacre, massacre memorials had been ended in 1783 and that the 4th of July, the celebration of the 4th of July took the place of those memorials. Um, and, and in that introduction, it, 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 looking back at that, it's clear that he's saying, you know, that we as a community decided at that point that we had, you know, we had achieved this goal of the, the liberty that was needed. And so, now we can celebrate. We can celebrate what we've achieved. And in, in 1858, um, <laughs> um, in discussing the, uh, the, you know, the existence and persistence of slavery, um, these, these orators were saying, and by kind of, they were bringing back and saying, you know, we're not, we're not done with the act of remembering in order to call for change. Um, we need to remember the life of Crispus Attucks um, as one of the victims of the Boston Massacre as a way to propel um, activism to end slavery. Um, and, um, and then there's, a, there's another story then that comes back to Old South Meeting House in the 20th century that we're, we're kind of looking at the same, uh, a similar, um, uh, kind of paradigm, but I'll save that because I don't want to go too far. <laughs> Can I jump in with a couple of uh, reflections um, that sort of, I think, amplify some of what Erica is saying here? Um, I, so, first of all, I think it's important for us to recognize that um, behind all of what we're talking about, protest then, protest now, um, is a question of common purpose, right? So, from one perspective, protest is about building common purpose in a democratic society in order to affect change, right? You need to shift opinion in order to bring people with you to get to different kinds of outcomes. But at the same time, it requires, it re requires common purpose to, for protesters to be dedicated to the cause to the extent that they turn out and express themselves. So um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a deep 
um, role that common purpose is playing in this. And memory plays an incredibly vital role in shaping common purpose and a sense of what binds us together and what we're trying to achieve. And, and I think in the revolutionary period and today, you see that happening in sort of two flavors. One is the remembrance of tragedy, right? We, I think memory is often the, the alchemy that we use to translate tragedy into a sense of purpose. Um, and that's what's happening in those March 5th orations, but it's also happening in the streets today when we say, um, let's remember George Floyd, let's remember those who have lost their lives as victims of police brutality, because by remembering them, um, we remind ourselves not to have let them died in, not to have let them have died in vain, um, and we are honoring their loss by carrying on in this way and demanding change. Um, the other kind of remembering that happens is the remembering of protest itself. So there's a long tradition in the revolutionary period of protesters paying homage to previous protests that have been successful. The reason the Liberty Tree becomes a thing in Boston is because it's seen as the place of origin of the original protest that affected change. And so we're going to protect that as a symbol of the power of protest, the power of ordinary people by insisting that their voices be heard to make change. And that's what's happening also in the 1850s when um, black abolitionists and their white allies organize that Christmas Addicts Day um, gathering. It, they're saying, let's remember the power of those past protests of the revolutionary period. Let's remember that Addicts was participating in a protest that had an effect. And let's do the same because we've got something to change now. So I think those those two kinds of remembering are really important for us to reflect on and, and to be thoughtful about when we look at the protests that are happening in the streets today, because it's happening there too. I feel like we've talked a little bit about kind of the goal of these protests amongst contemporaries, but how effective were they? Um, you know, we see these as iconic moments in the buildup to American independence um, for the people in the streets who they were trying to incite to action. Was that effective broadly? Um, we'll go with Matt first, you can kind of respond to that kind Do of Do I have to say one thing? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it depends on the protest, right? I mean, it also depends, I think, a little bit on how we understand what they were trying to achieve. I mean, ultimately, what they achieve is an independent nation with a new understanding of the relationship between the people and the law. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily what they set out to achieve. So I think a lot of the protests are sort of in one of two flavors. One is hold officials accountable um, and insist that they, if, that they change policy on the one side. And on the other, it's um, to force people who would prefer not to have to take a side to recognize that there are sides to be taken and to force them to either side with us or side against us. Um, and in that sense, I broadly, maybe you can say it's about changing public opinion um, or crystallizing public opinion. Um, I think, um, you know, there are moments where protest is really successful at achieving policy change. Um, you know, that I described before how that Stamp Act protest, and it wasn't the only one, there, there were then subsequent, what are described by the, the gentlemen of the town as riots, where they, you know, they set upon the lieutenant governor's house, and they set upon um, the, the, you know, other uh, pieces of, of property belonging to the ruling elite of colonial Massachusetts, and it terrifies everybody they managed to nullify the Stamp Act. And there's a lot of misunderstanding at the time about why Parliament repeals the Stamp Act the year after it was passed. But truly the reason is because they can't figure out how to enforce the thing because by 1766 in no colony in North America is, except for Georgia, is anybody willing to serve in the office of stamp distributor and the entire act depends on the stamp distributor. So very effective protest. Um, I, I, I think you can question whether other protests have uh, as, as efficacious an outcome. The protests in the streets outside the townhouse on the night of March 5th, 1770 that lead to the Boston Massacre 
are in many ways about the crowd trying to push the troops that had occupied Boston since fall of 1768 out of town. Um, that protest ends with five civilians dead. Um, and within weeks, um, the British army had been persuaded to remove the troops from town. So from that perspective, maybe we can say that it's effective. Um, but there are other protests that have exactly the contrary effect, like the destruction of the tea, which is meant to try to nullify the Tea Act, um, actually has the effect in Boston of leading to the abrogation of the vote and um, a, a, you know, representative government, at least for some period of time, and brings military occupation back. So it's, you know, it's singularly ineffective in achieving policy outcomes, but actually is really effective in driving people to support the cause of the Whigs who, you know, propelled that protest. So, um, you know, on the on the popular opinion side, what do I think? Like some of the protests have the effect of attracting support, but others others have exactly the opposite. I mean, there's a lot of people who believed that the Stamp Act should be repealed in 1765, who are so put off by the tactics that the protesters adopt, going after property and intimidating wealthy office holders, um, that they find themselves on the other side of the political divide suddenly, when there probably was common ground. So it's, it's, it's alienating for some, and, it, and it's divisive. Um, but over time, I mean, you can look, like, they managed to develop enough support for the cause of, um, of liberty that you, you end up with a successful revolution uh, against all the odds. I don't know, that was about as wishy-washy an answer as you can get there, Rosalie, but I think it's because it's complicated. I don't think it's supposed to have a single answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a very short discussion, I think, if it did. Right, right. Um, well, and I, you know, I, I think it's as complex today, right? I mean, what, we're going to have things cutting in multiple directions in the current moment as we seek to drive change in part through people who feel themselves to have been excluded from the political process, insisting that they be heard. Um, but, you know, a, a, a difference between the protests now and the, and the Black Lives Matter protests when they first began in 2014 is that um, right now the protests seem to have actually helped to garner additional support around the need for reform. In 2014, I think it had the opposite effect and it, it, it it wasn't able to achieve policy outcomes at that time. And maybe the lesson here is that it's never a quick fix, right? That it takes dedication to the cause. And we can look at all sorts of different periods in our nation's struggle for, uh, uh, for liberty and justice to see that like, often it is a, the long arc <laughs> and not um, an immediate correspondence between protests today and change tomorrow. I'm gonna ask you a slightly different version of that question, Erica. Um, and this is more in kind of how we talk about that kind of friction between popular opinion of protests and you know the feeling of that anger in pre-revolutionary Boston. Um, how do you teach something that for us is, I, I think for, for most of us, how we are taught to look at this period is with an eye of that success, that overwhelming success of these protests, that kind of step by step by step push towards the Revolutionary War. And, and how do you discuss that that might not have been what that looked like on the ground in you know, 1774? Um, you know, how do you start to break down that narrative a little bit? Or do you break it down? Mm. Um, wow, that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't know an answer. Um, I think, I think there are many, many answers. Um, I guess I, I can I can just point to 
some of the some of the challenges that I think come up in um, looking when when we're interested in educating the public about complexity <laughs> and complex uh, historical situations and um, encouraging critical thinking that includes um, considering similarities and differences um, between different situations in history and today. Um, uh, I mean, there's a there's just a lot of different um, there's a lot of different. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about this um, from the perspective of some combination of public programming and um, museum visitation and educational programs, especially for youth and school groups. Um, And I think I think overall that the the biggest challenges come from uh, what how do we engage how do we engage people in experiential learning um, that's really going to feel meaningful to them um, so what is like what's the hook for different situations and different um, different audiences and then how can we adapt the the content of the of the information exchange and processing and process um, so that we can be sharing some of that complexity and also including people in a in an active process um, and i I just I think um, and, and then there's the, the, um, the challenge, uh, that, that comes up with, uh, tourists who visit, uh, who want to hear a, you know, they, they want to be kind of retold the, the story that they already know. Um, and, um, that, that story of the, the, the celebration of the 4th of July. They, they, they want to be reminded of that. We, you know, we, we had a, we had a um, contest between tyranny and liberty and liberty won, and, um, and we still celebrate that today. And it's, it's clean. Um, and I, I think about the, um, uh, how we, how we talk about the, the, uh, we teach about the the meetings that happened that led to the Boston Tea Party, and um, it seems like there. Uh, it seems like there is a. I think there, just like historically in the Boston Tea Party reenactment. Um, the easiest way to engage the public is through this sense of sort of dichotomy and debate of like, you know, we're gonna, there's gonna be the Tories and the Whigs and they're gonna, they're gonna butt heads and, and then somebody's got to win. <laughs> um, and, and then we can, huzzah. Um, and, and then there's all the there's just, there's all the messy stuff um, that we, we are wanting to address and to inspire conversation around and learning. Um, and it's always, it's always, it's always harder to get the messy conversations to, to engage a broad range of people in the messy conversations, um, you know, and, and that includes uh, the 
the part of the story in the with the Boston Tea Party about the the Mohawk disguises and you know blaming it on the Native Americans and what were they doing? Why were they uh, Mohawk disguises? Um, why were they dressed dressed as Indians? Um, and uh, what's that all about? And uh, those are uh, those are complicated. Uh, there's no there's no quick simple answer to those questions. Um, but I think that the places where there are no quick simple answers are the places that are most important that we go um, and we explore how we can how we can translate those uh, those questions into meaningful dialogue and experiential learning um, and I there's a lot of there's a lot of answers out there um, and I, I just I think we're we're always those of us that are committed to um, public education are always uh, sort of looking to um, to find better ways of, of doing those things. That's yeah, Erica, I, I, I would just, I would just reflect, I, I think that, you know, the, we have a, we have a really important story to tell and it can help people to understand the present better, but it only helps them if the questions that we're opening up um, through that exploration are questions that are authentically relevant to the audiences that we're working with. And so it just, it involves a lot of work with um, whether it's a school group in advance helping uh, to get to a place where we understand what is authentically meaningful to them in their present lives and how can we bring this to bear on them, or whether it's, you know, we really feel like um, we could provide a platform for conversation about some of the issues that people have taken to the streets in protest of right now. Um, but we can't step in and say like, we think this is what's important. It has to be like, we have a service to provide, um, but we need to understand what's authentically meaningful, what you want to explore and then support that, right? So that we're partnering and making meaning instead of like downloading, because um, we won't get anywhere if we just download our, our thoughts. Like we're doing now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and for for me, that's um, that's you know perhaps the thing that's most exciting about this new organization and um, the mission and vision is that in terms of the work that I'm um, being asked to do here is um, that real commitment to partnership for uh, to for creating content um, in you know in so many different ways uh, and that's really that's what I find um, that's what gives that's what excites me that's what gets me out of bed in the morning is is feeling like I'm working with um, I'm with, working with a broad range of people to um, to create content that is um, that is really meaningful and relevant um, um, today. Yeah. Uh, I will say before I move on to my next uh, question, uh, for those of you who have never had the opportunity to be walking through the hall at Old South Meeting House while one of those kind of place-based learning recreation of the uh, Tea Party debates is happening at Old South with the school group, it is a really fascinating and both like a little bit funny, um, but also really thought provoking experience to watch fairly small elementary school children take the stage to debate two different perspectives that you know they wouldn't have been able to inhabit before they walked in the building and, and seeing them step into a, a role that they quite possibly don't agree with um, but proclaim that and have that that passion in themselves is it's a really really enlightening look about how we can teach history um, so I, I, I love on a coffee break coming back in and walking uh, into that room full of, of elementary school kids and seeing them go through that process yeah it's 
it's it is fun um i have to say um that that um that program can just keeps on taking on fresh life with each group and um yeah and it's gets better um but related to that i was just going to point out that you know one of the things i keep coming back to and thinking about these questions is that the promise that i i really do think that theater and different forms of theater have to um promote this this kind of really active um thinking and learning about about issues um so that's another thing that's exciting to me because i feel like i mean that that program in particular is really a um yeah, the success of it is based upon largely upon the fact that it is theater. It is, you know, everybody gets to be part of a kind of participate in an active drama. And um, so I'm excited to see moving forward um, other new ways that we we might continue to use theater um, as an educational tool. Uh, that is a beautiful segue to my next question. So. Thank you for that comment. Um, uh, it was the, that way. <laughs> um, for the people who wrote in questions ahead of time, a number of them touched on the theme of who was and was not able um, to be present at the protests. And I think that's something that the theater that has been put on um, both during society and now Revolutionary Spaces um, really touched upon that question very well. Um, so if you could um, switch to Nat this time, I guess, um, can I discuss the makeup of those protesters in the revolutionary era? Yeah, I mean, we, we're, um, our sources are imperfect. We don't have photographs and where we do have visual depictions, they reflect the biases of the artist as well. There's a lot of debate, for example, about is there a woman in the engraving that Paul Revere did of the um, of the Boston Massacre, where there's a crowd of protesters gathered, and you, know, you have people who say, oh yeah, totally, and other people who say, I don't see it. Um, but I think what we can say are a couple things, right? So the, the two buildings that we care for, um, both in their own ways had restrictions on who was allowed to be heard within them or enter them. Um, uh, you, you couldn't get onto the second floor of the townhouse without being a servant or a member of the elite. Um, you, you certainly could belong to the congregation at Old South Meeting House, um, no matter what walk of life you came from, but you, you couldn't participate in one of the meetings, um, that the political meetings that happened there as readily if you were uh, a woman or a person of color, for example. Um, so we, one of the things that's exciting about putting the two buildings together in one kind of shared interpretive framework or visitor experience is that we also now have the street between the two buildings as a space, as a canvas on which to, to tell the story of, of protest. And we do know that, um, that the, the crowds that gathered for marches and for outdoor protests included a much wider range of folks. So, you know, that during the 17, it's during 1767 and 68, um, when uh, some in the town are trying to enforce uh, a boycott, basically, of British imports. Um, there's often picket lines in front of uh, merchants who are selling goods imported from England, and the depictions make it clear, like, there's young apprentices in those crowds, there's women in those crowds, there's people of color in those crowds. Um, the, the space under the Liberty Tree, um, which came to be called Liberty Hall was a place where many protest meetings or protest marches began and then they marched out from there. And sometimes there were, um, there was speechifying that happened beforehand. And you can find even in the most radical newspapers in town, um, accounts of the meeting that happened there in which people are horrified um, that certain kinds of people seem to have had a voice. Um, so, um, I, but I, I think what we can say is that there's the the protests are certainly more plebeian. There's more working people, um, you know, who who didn't necessarily have easy access to formal politics. They're finding a space for their own um, political uh, activities. There, there's um, 
you know, and there are, there are women and, and there are people of color, but it's not, it, you know, there's, a, there's, um, there's, there's certainly remain boundaries that um, are incredibly difficult to cross uh, at that time. One, one of the things that's interesting to me in, in terms of thinking about different types of meetings and that um, uh, di and different types of protest um, is that in terms of the meetings that happened and that we kind of consider as political that happened inside Old South Meeting House during this time period, um, that the 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 most inclusive were those um, uh, 5th of March or Boston Massacre, as we call them today, um, memorials um, that we know included women, children, people of color. Um, there's even a, um, there is a passage in the diary of Anna Green Winslow, who was a member of the Old South congregation um, and um, while she was, I, I believe, uh, she kept that diary just between the ages of about 12 and 14. And so somewhere in there in that age group, like early teenage years, she has a, um, a mention that she had had to miss the, the, I don't remember exactly how she referred to it, but it was clear that it was, it was a memorial meeting. It was one of those uh, Boston Massacre Memorial uh, meetings that she hadn't been able to go because she had a bad head cold, and so she had to stay home. Um, <laughs> and um, you know, it's just uh, thinking about the um, that that those were um, as, as memorial meetings that th that they were open to perhaps everybody, or at least closer to everybody than than the other meetings. Um, and I. I, when I've um, kind of had conversations with with youth about the um, the fact that yes, more people were included, were able, were allowed to attend or could attend the um, the meetings to talk about the tea um, in 1773, uh, then say you know town the town meetings said where you, to, to vote, you know, the, the voting requirements at Faneuil Hall, um, you know, were way more restrict restrictive than who could attend those. Um, but the fact that women and people of color were still, um, as far as we know, were completely excluded from uh, those, uh, those 1773 um, tea, um, tea tax meetings or whatever we call them, not meetings of the body of the people. Um, uh, you know, one of the, the ways that that I've kind of thought about it is that you know while it, it, it there was a protest element to it, it like I said before there was also kind of a legal element to it there was a uh, they they were there were votes there were there were formal decisions being made about actions and um, that seems that seems like you know certainly women were not um, women and enslaved people um, or free blacks would not have been considered, you know. Rosalie, I know we're bumping up against the end here, but I, I just wanted to add one thought on this because I think it's really important in light of what um, was unfolding around us right now. Um, I think it's important for us to recognize that there, there remained even in the most popular forms of protest, um, a kind of exclusionary sensibility around um, people of certain backgrounds. Um, and, and I think it points back to the question of legitimacy, right? So remember, there's this ongoing puzzle of like, how can we have protest that drives change um, in, in the halls of government without undermining the appearance of legitimacy for the work that we're doing? And um, whose voice was expressed in the protests was fundamental to how they were perceived. And you see this so vividly in the aftermath of the Boston Massacre, right, where that crowd contained many, many 
people of color, and one of them is shot, um, Crispus Attucks, who's of mixed African and Native American ancestry, right, and uh, was a self-liberated former enslaved man um, and a sailor. And, and you know, it, so after afterwards, when the soldiers are tried, John Adams defends the soldiers, and everybody knows that the easiest way to defend the soldiers is to try the town and to say, essentially, the soldiers act in self-defense. The town went crazy and attacked the soldiers. And Adams takes the job of defending the soldiers, and partly because he doesn't want that defense, right? But he still knows that's the easiest way to get off. So he, his middle road is to say, is to draw a distinction between what he calls the good people of Boston, who were just protesting in a peaceful way, and then the crazy rabble, which you know, in his accounting included saucy boys and Irish teagues and Jack Tars, otherwise known as sailors, and Negroes, right? So he takes whole categories of people and says, they're illegitimate in this crowd, and they're responsible, and it was a riot. Um, but over here, the good people are doing something. And I think we have to grapple with that because it's, those exclusions are a feature, not a bug of the protests at the time. And to the extent that we're still grappling with questions of racial justice in our country today, it's partly rooted in those decisions that were made at that time, which we can understand, but um, it's not just like, we were given a perfect set of documents and we just haven't lived up to them. It was built in um, to the moment of foundation for the country that there are lines and there are boundaries and there are those whose voices still were excluded. So when people take to the streets today to, to say, my voice matters too, and to insist that other people uh, be held accountable to that, we have to recognize the roots of that in our founding moment. Thank you for the thought. I'm, time considerations aside, I'm glad that you included that. Um, um, but I do have to mention time considerations. Um, we are uh, just about at the end of our program. Um, and so I wanted to thank you both for sharing your knowledge and insight with us. And thank you to all of our members for spending part of your day with us. Um, we appreciated all of your questions. We hope that we covered um, as many of them as we could um, in our discussions. And it was, I think, a really wonderful thing to see kind of your thinking on this through those questions. Um, I do want to say a personal thank you. Um, your support has been vital during these past few months. Um, through your generous contributions and enthusiastic support, we have been able to translate our work from you know, the iconic and beloved historical sites that we work at into this virtual world. And that is so much because of your support. Um, make sure you're following Revolutionary Spaces on social media. Check out the newsletters for updates and more programs. Um, I am looking forward to the next time I get to see you in this virtual space or in person. Um, so thank you for your time today and stay safe. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Bye.